cannot teach the titan law as given you are bringing back what is dead to life he takes away the first that he may establish the second the titan law is dead the bible says the dead shall be thrown into the lake of fire he killed malachi 3 that he may establish the second so if they take you to malachi 3 take them to revelation 22 that the dead shall be thrown into the lake of fire so the titan law has been killed it must not exist side by side the law of the spirit of life in christ jesus has set me what free from the law of sin and death join dr abel damino the senior pastor of power city international as he explores exegetically bible doctrine on tight and tithing date from sunday 14th of march to sunday 21st of march 2021 time monday 15th to saturday 20th 6 p.m daily sundays 8 a.m and 11 a.m gmt plus one join the broadcast on radio aquibum 90.5 fm uyo 11 a.m to 1 p.m xl fm 106.9 uyo 1 p.m to 3 p.m daily Unuyo fm 100.7 3 p.m to 5 p.m comfort fm 95.1 uyo 6 p.m to 8 p.m inspiration fm 105.9 uyo 9 p.m to 10 p.m and heritage radio 104.9 10 p.m till midnight and also on kingdom live network station also live on facebook at abel damino public figure youtube abel damino ministries international twitter abel damino and instagram at abel damino watch real time host doctors abel and rachel damino don't miss out
is my salvation. Say, Jesus is my salvation. Jesus is my righteousness. Jesus is my righteousness. Jesus is my true. Sukele de Brena Hata, Egebo Jaka, Membra Gado Zocolo de Brena, Cacangele de Baya, Lebato, Bingalina, Mangalado, Borocuta, Sekele de Brena, Cacarita, Sikia. Thank you, Father. In the name of Jesus, Heavenly Father, we come humbly and respectfully before your holy written word today. Thank you for the mighty Holy Spirit that lives on our inside to guide us into all the truth. Thank you for the privilege to feed your people with your word tonight. And I ask that revelation knowledge is gifted everyone connected to this service around the world. I decree that bodies and yokes are destroyed. Whatever is not planted by God is rooted out. And I declare that your people are built up, equipped, edified. And by the end of this service, Jesus is glorified. Thank you for the blessing that is upon this service tonight. In Jesus' precious name. And every believer says a powerful amen. amen. Lift your right hands to heaven. Let's release our faith together as we say these words. I am born of God. I am born of the world. The word of God is my nature. I do not struggle to do the world. 
I do the word naturally. Therefore today, I will understand the word of his grace. I will be built up. By the end of this service, I will never be the same. Never ever be the same again. In Jesus name. And every believer says a powerful amen. We well, want to welcome everybody connected to this service by way of Kingdom Life Network, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, our social media family. We're glad to welcome all of you to the service tonight. We also want to welcome the entire Akwai Bomb State community connected to this service by way of Comfort FM, XL FM Radio, Akwai Bomb, you know you FM, and all of you that are connected tonight by way of Inspiration FM and Heritage FM. We're so glad to welcome all of you today <clears throat> to this wonderful service. Do me the favor of calling a friend, a family member, a loved one. Ask them to tune to this radio station right now. Life is flowing through the airwaves. Our social media community also. Do me the favor you've always done. Let's get the truth of God's word to the ends of the earth. I'd like you to help me share the video on your page. And then of course share with all the groups on your page. Tag some people. Create watch parties please as much as possible. Let's get to as many people as possible tonight with the truth of the gospel. Also drop the messages on monogram, telegram. Drop them on WhatsApp group and it's going to be an exciting adventure in the word of his grace. All our campuses and everybody connected to the service. We're so glad to welcome all of you tonight. Hey guys, fasting your seat belts. It's going to be an exciting adventure in the word of his grace. And if you're just joining for the first time, we welcome you to this great time of fellowship in the light of God's word. All right, grab your pen, your notebook, and your Bible, and you can be seated with your sweet, smart self as we get into the word tonight. <clears throat> Praise God, all right? We're examining Bible truth on tithe and tithing. Bible truth on tithe and tithing. The book of 2 Timothy, chapter 2, verse number 15. 2 Timothy, chapter 2, verse number 15. Brother Paul writes to Timothy, a protege, and he says to Timothy, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Brother Paul, in talking to Timothy, and as he's talking to Timothy, this is a man, Brother Paul writes to, acknowledging that he understands Brother Paul's message. In 2 Timothy 3.15, Brother Paul says this about Timothy, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Now notice what he says to the same person in 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 15. Now he says you have known the holy scripture, you have become acquainted with the holy scripture. That is, you know your way around the Holy Scripture. So he has established that Timothy knows the message of salvation, which is the message of the Bible. But look at what he says to this same person who knows the message. Second Timothy chapter 2 verse number 15 again. He now says to him, study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needed not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth the word study there and that is why it's very important to pay attention to the use of words the bible is a book of words therefore words are very important and critical in bible study remember that the entire revelation of god is communicated via words so that word study in today's english is like you know give yourself to reading books and all of that but in the English of that day, when it was written, the word study is a Greek word, spudazo. Spudazo, it means be eager or be diligent. Be eager or be diligent. It's an old English word. Look at where the word study is used again. Second Timothy chapter 4, verse number 9. Second Timothy chapter 4, verse number 9. Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. Same word, study diligence so diligence interprets the word study diligence interprets the word study so in your mind he is not talking about reading like he's talking about preaching the emphasis here is on preaching the word rightly dividing the word of truth that word rightly dividing is one word 
is the Greek word ototomio. Ototomio. O R T O T O. I mean O R T H O T O M M O. Ototomio. The word ototomio is a Greek word. And when you are talking to a man like Paul, who is a builder, when he says rightly dividing the word of truth. The word rightly dividing is to cut straight. To cut straight. There are two words there. The word temno, T-E-M-N-O, temno, and the word otos, O-R-T-O-S. Temno means to cut, to cut. Otos means straight, to cut straight. So when that is used, it is used to show carefulness or properliness. Carefulness or properliness. So if you are writing to somebody who already knows the Holy Scriptures and you are saying, be eager, be diligent to show yourself approved unto God. You know, the word approved unto God doesn't mean approved for God to see you. It means you are tested by God. You are tested by God. It's the word dokimazo in the Greek. Dokimazo. It means you have been tested by God. Let people know, therefore, that you have been approved of God. You have been approved of God. Now, please pay attention. A, a workman that needs not to be ashamed. A workman that needs not to be ashamed. People say, well... Don't teach so that people will know. Don't do it for people to know. Actually, you should teach so people know you know. So people will know that you know exactly what you are saying. That's what brother Paul was saying to Timothy here. To show yourself that you have been approved. You have been tested by God. Then he says, a workman that need not to be ashamed before men. That needs not to be ashamed before men. Rightly dividing the word of truth. That is a word that was taken from Proverbs chapter 3 verse number 6. Proverbs chapter 3 verse number 6. And then the writer of Proverbs says, In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. He shall direct thy paths. So he will direct your path. That will direct your path is what you will find in the Septuagint Greek as ototomio. In the Septuagint Greek as ototomio. That is to direct things properly. To direct things properly. In other words, what he is saying to Timothy is this. If you will preach, direct yourself properly in the midst of the scriptures if you will preach direct yourself properly in the midst of the scriptures and that's very valid there are two comparisons when the word ototomio is used early users of this word we are into mining mining where when you are mining you are not doing anything to create a mineral when you are mining, you are not doing anything to create a mineral. What you are basically doing is you are bringing out what is already there. You are bringing out what is already there. So, those who interpret that word again, we are, you know, made, we're into something. That is what they are saying is that Paul used the word autotomio as a direct opposite of innovation. The word autotomio is a direct opposite of innovations. In other words, when you are preaching, do not innovate what is not there. When you are preaching, do not innovate what is not there. Your role as a preacher is to bring out what is there. To bring out what is there. Like the miners will bring out the precious stones. So it's the exact opposite of an innovation. Because 
Innovation is when something is already on your mind. Something is already, you have a preconceived notion or a mindset. Something is already on your mind. Then you look for a scripture to back it up. That is innovation. Something, your ideas, your nuances. You look for a scripture that sounds like your preconceived notion to back up your notion. And that's how the people of my community, the Pentecostals, use the Bible. They will say, what scripture do you have for what you are saying? Back it up, back it up. They like backing things up. And backing things up is the mother of all error. Backing things up is the mother of all error. Rather than say, where is it in the scripture? I can look for a single scripture or a scripture and twist it to say there is no God. After all, that is how the devil operates. The devil just quotes scriptures. He quotes scriptures. He tells Jesus, it is written, fall down. He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep you in all your ways. He quoted a scripture. But that is not the context of that scripture. The devil quotes scriptures to back up his nuances and to back up his preconceived ideas or notions. So, it's not looking for the scripture to back it up. But, it is to let the scriptures interpret itself. Let the scriptures interpret itself. You allow the scriptures tell you what they intend to say so in bible study one of the things you know someone said if you have a preconceived idea something you want scriptures to attest to that already exists in your mind you will never see the truth if you have a preconceived idea and then you're looking for scriptures to attest to it you will never see the truth you won't see the truth because you already have a mindset. So you must not go to the scriptures to defend anything but the scriptures itself. You must not go to the scriptures to defend anything but the scriptures itself. So ototomio is the exact opposite of an innovation. It's an excavation, not an innovation. It means you will not add to it. You just cut through. Not adding to it. You just cut through. So your role will be to take the scriptures. To match the scriptures. To explain the scriptures. Your role will be to take the scriptures. To match the scriptures. In a bid to explain the scriptures. That is letting the scriptures explain itself. That is sound Bible study or sound Bible teaching. Remember, I have taught you about context. And I said, context means to explain a verse with the surrounding verses. You explain a verse with the surrounding verses using the aid of pretext, post-text to open up the context. Pretext, post-text to open up the context. I also have said that observation is key. What you don't observe, you cannot interpret. What you don't observe, you cannot interpret. Because you can only interpret what you observe. The moment you don't observe details of something, it simply means you will not interpret it properly. The moment you don't observe the details of something, it simply means you cannot interpret it properly. So, a major work of a Bible student or a Bible teacher is to be observant. Be observant. Because in Bible study, you think through. You think through. Read the Bible first. Read through and observe. Because what you do not read and observe, you cannot interpret. I repeat, what you do not read and observe, you cannot interpret. You know, in one of the first laws of Bible study, first law of Bible study and Bible teaching is, 
you must read. You must read. Ephesians chapter 3, verse number 3, a letter written by Brother Paul to the church at Ephesus. He says to them, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery as I wrote afore in few words. The mystery as I wrote afore in few words. So Brother Paul says, I wrote it. Why did he write it? Why did he write it? Because this is a very key issue in understanding God's mind. I wrote it. So, it is written so that it can be read. It is written so that it can be read. It has to be read. Whereby, when you read, whereby, when you read, give me that verse 4. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 4. Whereby, when you read, so reading is critical. When you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. When you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. So he says, I wrote it. When Paul wrote to Ephesus, he expected them to first of all read what he wrote. And read it painstakingly, patiently, with observation. Paying attention. Paul says, when you read, if you really read, you may understand. The reading here is used 32 times. 32 times. The word read is used 32 times. The frequency of the use of that word says something. When you read is the Greek word anaginosko. Anaginosko. The word anaginosko is two words. Ana means again. A and A. Again. Ginosko, G I N O S K O, means to recognize. To recognize again. Anaginosko. To recognize again. Imagine. If you have the word again, it means you must keep reading it. It shows you something you must keep reading. When Paul said, when you read, you may understand. If I'm going to say it in today's language, I will say, when you keep reading, you may understand. When you keep reading, so you have a duty in Bible study, the first rule, like I said, is observation. But for you to observe, you must read well. You must read well. Because if you do not read well, you cannot understand. What you have not read well, you cannot interpret. What you have not read well, you cannot interpret. So, you know there are scriptures that are just on your mind. And sometimes you assume that you know them. And the reason why you assume that you know them is because as a Christian over the years, you have had people taught that scripture, you have recited that scripture, you have memorized that scripture, but you have never paid attention to what that scripture is saying in context. So you are just full of assumption. That is why the first rule is to read the word anaginosko. It's used to relieve an experience. Anaginosko is used to relieve an experience. When you relieve an experience, the way you play a major movie, you know, and when you play that movie again and again, as you're watching the movie after the first time, the second time, you begin to recognize certain things in the movie that sticks because you watched it again and again. So when you read the Bible, you read again and again. In the process of reading, you begin to recognize, you begin to observe. Very key in Bible study. You keep looking at it again and again. He that looketh into the perfect law of liberty. He not being a forgetful hearer, James chapter 1 verse 25, that's where I'm reading from. Put it up for me, James chapter 1 verse 25. But whoso looketh 
into the perfect law of liberty and continue it. And continue it. He being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. That is, you look at the scriptures again and again. So we have the duty not to have read the scriptures, but to be reading the scriptures. You didn't hear that. We have the duty not to have read the scriptures, but to be reading the scriptures. Please pay attention. Understanding revelation is related to how dutiful and how diligent we are in reading. Understanding revelation is related to how dutiful and how diligent we are in reading. It's critical. Reading is very key in Bible study. To know that word anaginosko. Whereby when you read, you may understand. It's not just I have seen it before. I mean, look at the way Jesus always asks them questions. You know, you know, Dr. Gabriel. Matthew 12, verse 2. Matthew chapter 12, verse number 2. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. Verse 3. Look at what Jesus said to them. But he said unto them, Have you not read what David did when he was unhungered and they that were with him jesus used it several times let's see a few now observe he is not saying they didn't know it's like saying you have not read properly you didn't pay attention when you were reading look at verse 5 of matthew 12 verse 5 now verse 5 matthew 12 verse 5 or have you not read in the law how that on the sabbath days the priests in the temple profane the sabbath and ablimless have you not read properly in the law then you will see jesus again speaking to the jews in matthew chapter 19 verse 14 i mean verse 4 matthew chapter 19 verse number 4 and he answered and said unto them have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female have you not read what he's saying is address your mind that is you are asking these questions because you have not addressed your mind properly to the facts you have not addressed your mind properly to the facts that's why you are asking these questions have you not read means to relieve the moment to relieve the moment to see it again in fact if i was to interpret it today i will say go and read again <laughs> go and read again because what he said already implied they know they have an idea of that text but they are not reading it properly they have an idea, but they are not reading it properly. So, there's a properliness. A properliness in reading. You address your mind to the issues. In reading, you address your mind to the issues. You know, believers just casually read the scriptures. No seriousness. And like I always say, if the way you went to the university and read your university books your law, your medicine, your architecture, your, 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 you know, your, your, all your engineering. If you, if the way you're reading the Bible is the way you read your school books, you will not just be a failure. You will be the father of failures. Because a lot of Christians don't just pay attention at all. They spiritualize everything and they are not paying attention. So we have to, we have to attach a diligence, a seriousness, a dutifulness an observation in the reading of the holy wreath look at matthew 21 verse 16 matthew chapter 21 verse number 16 <clears throat> and he said unto them hearest thou what this say and jesus saith unto them yea have you never read out of the mouth of babes and sucklings has thou perfected praise 
Have you never read Jesus is asking them? Look at Matthew 24, 42. Matthew chapter 24, verse 42. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord don't come. Now, whenever he says, have you not read, those verses are verses among verses. Have you not read, is a verse among verses, pretext and posttext. That's to say, have you not paid attention to the context? Have you not paid attention to the context? So, the kind of reading involved is to take note or to take notice. To take note or to take notice. Look at Matthew 22, 31. Matthew chapter 22, verse number 31. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have you not read, look at how many times Jesus keeps saying, have you not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, 32, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. So, it is important to read. Reading cannot be substituted with any other thing. You must read true. You must read true. You must read the scriptures true and true and true. One of the watchwords of a Bible teacher or Bible student is, you must be careful not to teach anything new. You must always repeat old truths. Truth is truth because it has a character of consistency. No matter how many times you repeat the truth, it is always the same. And sometimes it can be boring. But that is why it is the truth. It never changes. It's always the same. You must always repeat all truths. And you cannot repeat them in a diff you can repeat them in a different way, but still having the same content. The truth must always align as the truth. That's why I mentioned to you three different streams of preaching in the charismatic circles. Number one stream is, give me a scripture to back it up. I want to back it up. That's the grandmother of error. You are not supposed to back up something with scripture. Scriptures are supposed to explain themselves. We don't back up. We explain. That's why Paul will say, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. 2 Timothy 3.16 And is profitable for doctrine, reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So scripture explains scripture. Scriptures do not back up your experience. Scriptures explain scripture. Scripture does not back up your experience. Using your, the second method, the first one is to back it up. The second method of preaching by charismatics is using your experience to teach scriptures. Using your experience to teach scriptures. Eventually, your nuances and ideas come into the explanation, making it a bad product. Your nuances your experiences and ideas get tangled with the explanation of scripture, making it a bad product. The third stream, which is the right stream, is to allow scripture to explain itself. Allow scripture to explain. Listen, the scriptures have a mind of its own. The scripture have a mind of its own. And the scripture has its own bias. The scripture is a book of bias. That's why Jesus was saying in John 5, 39, you search the scriptures. For in them, you think you have eternal life, for they are they which testify of me. They are they which testify of me. Pay attention. I know we're dealing with tight and tighting, but I like to always lay a framework so that when we get into the nitty gritties of our subject, it's easy to navigate. You know, a good number of people argue over doctrine. And the reason is simple because 
they have not been taught the right way of explaining scripture. It was never taught them. So they argue because all that they were shown is what they know. And when you are bringing the right in, the first thing is their mind will fight it. But if they have the Holy Ghost on the inside, he begins to be a witness that what you are hearing is true. You need to pay attention. That's why some people, after fighting and going around, they come back and become ardent followers of the teaching of God's word in his properliness. Now, there's another problem with, 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 with teaching the Bible or reading the Bible. And that is what we call proof texting. Proof texting. Proof texting is attempting to look for a verse that has the word of what you are about to say. And that verse has a word that is about what you want to say. So you now use that verse to support what you are saying. That is proof texting. Then we have contexting. What we should be doing is contexting, not proof texting. Contexting is letting the scriptures interpret itself. Letting the scriptures interpret itself. We also said, if you miss out a detail, a detail, your interpretation will be defective. If you miss out a detail, your interpretation will be defective. Because even though Bible understanding can be a gradual process, but must be a gradual process in the right path. In the right path. So, if you miss out the observation and the interpretation, you are never going to get it right. You know, when people have been wrongly taught, they can die trying to defend the error. That's the danger. They can die trying to to defend the error. You remember the man in Acts 8, 28? Acts chapter 8, verse number 28. Put it up for me quickly. Acts chapter 8, verse 28. Was returning and sitting, and this is the guy we call the Ethiopian eunuch. Was returning and sitting in his chariot and read Isaiah the prophet. 29. Then the spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. 30. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? Many people are reading scriptures today, but do they understand what they are reading? Remember, we are dealing with tithe, the practice, the explanation, and the malpractice of tithe. The practice, the explanation, and the malpractice of tithe. Yesterday, we established a number of salient things. And uh, there are some things i like us to look at that we taught. Number one, these are facts you need to take note of. Number one, in the 40 years that the instruction on tithing was given to the Jews, it was never carried out. None of them paid tithe. For 40 years because the tithe or the titan was supposed to be when they entered Canaan. When they entered Canaan. That's why he said in the land. You don't call something in the land when you are still in the journey. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 12 verse 1. Deuteronomy chapter 12 verse number 1. These are the statutes and judgments which you shall observe to do in the land. In the land which the Lord of God of thy fathers giveth thee to possess it all the days that you live upon the earth in the land. So Moses' instructions on the tithe was for Canaan. Moses' instructions on the tithe was for Canaan. Look at that Deuteronomy chapter 12. I'm going to read verse 5 and 6 and 19. Verse 5 and 6. And verse 19. But unto the place which the Lord your God shall choose out of all your tribes to put his name there. Even unto his habitation shall you seek and thither thou shalt come. Verse 6. And thither you shall bring your burnt offerings and your sacrifices and your tithes. And heave offerings of your hand and your vows and your freewill offerings and the firstlings of your herds. And 
of your flock. Look at verse 19. Verse 19. Take it to thyself that thou forsake not the Levite as long as thou livest upon the earth. So basically, the tithe here was not done within the first 40 years when Moses gave the commandment because it was to be carried out in the land where they were going. So, which means Moses was not around when they started giving tithes because the tithes we are for the land. The tithes, we are for the land. Please pay attention. Number two, pay attention. The tithe has conditions. The tithe has conditions. The conditions were if they were expelled from the land or if they left the land, Moses told them to stop tithing. If they were expelled from the land or they left the land, Moses told them to stop tithing. Look at Deuteronomy 12, 19. <clears throat> Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 19. Take heed to thyself that thou forsake not the Levite for as long as thou livest upon the earth. The earth there is the promised land. Upon the land. That is, if you notice, when they went into Babylon and all the captives, there was no tithe at all when they were in Babylon. Nobody paid tithe. It was when they returned that the issue of tithing was mentioned again. Because it is for the particular place. If they are in captivity, they are not supposed to tithe. Because the tithing was for the land of Canaan. That's number two. Number three, Leviticus 27.30. Leviticus chapter 27 verse number 30. <clears throat> and all the tithe of the land, the land, Canaan, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree is the Lord. It is holy unto the Lord. Again, he emphasizes the land. Look at Deuteronomy 26, 15. Lots of scriptures good for your health. Deuteronomy 26, 15. Look down from thy holy habitation from heaven and bless thy people, Israel, and the land, and the land which thou hast given us as thou swearest unto our fathers, a land that floweth with milk and honey. A land that floweth with milk and honey. So, in the 40 years in the wilderness, they didn't pay tithe because they were going to a land. It was from the land that they will give. So that means that generation that came out of Egypt never paid tithe. All of them because they never entered the land. They died in the wilderness. That means they never paid tithe because it was for a specific Land Number four. The fourth thing you notice is this. In the seventh year called the year of Jubilee. The year of Jubilee. There was no tithe taken. There was no tithe taken in the year of Jubilee. Exodus 23 verse 9 to 11. Pay attention. Exodus 23 verse 9 to 11. Also, thou shalt not oppress a stranger, for you know the heart of a stranger, seeing you were strangers in the land of Egypt. And six years thou shalt sow thy land, and shalt gather in the fruits thereof. But the seventh year thou shalt let it rest and lie still, that the poor of thy people may eat. And what they leave the baskets of the field shall eat. In like manner thou shalt deal with thy vineyard and with thy olive yard, with thy vineyard, and with thine olive yard. Look at Leviticus chapter 25, verse 3 to 7. Leviticus 25, 3. Six years thou shalt sow thy land, and six years thou shalt prune thy vineyard, and gather in the fruit thereof. Six years, all right? Give me verse, verse, the next verse, verse 4. Verse 4. But in the seventh year shall be a Sabbath of rest unto the land. 
a Sabbath for the Lord. Thou shalt neither sow thy field nor prune thy vineyard. Next verse. That which groweth of his own accord of thy harvest, thou shalt not reap. Neither gather the grapes of thy vine undress. For it is a year of rest unto the land. Next verse. And the Sabbath of the land shall be meet for you of the land. For thee and for thy servant and for thy maid. For thy hired servant and for thy stranger that sojourneth with thee. Verse 7. And for thy cattle and the beast. And for the beasts that are in the land shall all the increase thereof be meat. Look at verse 11 and 12 of the same chapter. 11 and 12. A jubile shall that 50th year be, year be unto you. You shall not sow, neither reap that which groweth of itself in it, nor gather the grapes in it of thy vine undressed. Verse 12. For it is the jubile, it shall be holy unto the Lord. You shall eat the increase thereof out of the land. Verse 20 and 22 of the same chapter. 20 and 22. And if you shall say, what shall we eat the seventh year? Behold, we shall not sow, nor gather in our increase. Next verse. And you shall sow the eighth year and eat. Then I will command my blessing upon you in the sixth year. And it shall bring forth fruit for three years. And you shall sow the eighth year and eat. Yet of all fruit until the ninth year. Until our fruits come in, you shall eat of the old store. So there was an exemption, exemption in those years. The seventh year and the fiftieth year, no tithing. The fifth thing to take note of is, notice that the poor were not to tithe. The poor were not to tithe. Deuteronomy 26, 12. The poor were not to tithe. Deuteronomy 26, 12. When thou hast made an end of tithing all the tithes of thine increase, the third year, which is the year of tithing, and has given it unto the Levite, the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, that they may eat within thy gates and be filled. Next verse. Then thou shalt say before the Lord thy God, I have brought away the hallowed things out of mine house, and also have given them unto the Levite, and unto the stranger, to the fatherless, to the widow, according to all thy commandments, which thou hast commanded me, and I have not transgressed thy commandments, neither have I forgotten them. Now so, those who did not have, we are to receive. The Levite, the stranger, the fatherless, the widow. Look at Leviticus 19.10. You can read that at home. Leviticus 19.10 and Leviticus 23.22. Now, let's get to the star scripture. Malachi chapter 3 verse 3. <clears throat> Malachi chapter 3 verse 3. And he shall see it as a refiner and purifier of silver. Purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Verse 4 to 5. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. And I will come near to you to judgment. And I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers. And against the adulterers. And against false swearers. And against those that oppress the hireling in his wages. The widow and the fatherless. And that turn aside the stranger from his right. And fear not me. saith the Lord of hosts. If you observe very well. One of the rebukes in Malachi was that they were not taking care of the poor, the widow, and the fatherless. Because the poor, the widow, and the fatherless were to receive help because they had nothing to tithe from. Notice again that the Lord's tithe was to take care of those who had no land. Because there were those who had no land, the Levites. And there were those that were poor, 
who couldn't take care of themselves. The same way the Levites were taking care of, the poor also were taking care of. The poor were not to tithe. Then look at Deuteronomy 24, 19. Deuteronomy 24, verse 19. When thou cuttest down thy harvest in thy field, and hast forgot a sheaf in the field, thou shalt not go again to fetch it. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, for the widow, that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all the work of thy hand. Next verse. When thou beatest thine olive tree, thou shalt not go over the bogs again. It shall be for the stranger, the fatherless, and for the widow. Next verse. When thou gatherest the grapes of thy vineyard, thou shalt not glean it afterward. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, and for the widow. So eventually you will see that the thing about the tithe was to help others. The thing about the tithe was not for the pastor to keep collecting and collecting and be eating and be eating. Look up everybody. It was not for the pastor to be collecting. It was to help. The tithe was to help others. So they were taken care of differently. If there was left over from the harvest, he said leave it for those who don't have what to eat. You won't tithe from that left over because the poor will take it. That's why, you know, that was why. And you can see that Jesus' parents were not qualified to pay tithe because Jesus' parents were poor. So they were not qualified to pay tithe. Look at something unique. Leviticus chapter 12 verse 6. Leviticus chapter 12 verse 6. And when the days of her purifying are fulfilled for a son or for a daughter, she shall bring a lamb of the first year for a burnt offering and a young pigeon or a turtle dove for a sin offering unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation unto the priest. Now look at Jesus. Luke 2.22. Luke chapter 2 verse 22 and 24. And when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present Jesus to the Lord. Verse 24. And to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord. A pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. They didn't pay tithe. They just brought a sacrifice because it was a poor family. That is why they were supposed to give. But Jesus' parents didn't even because they were poor. Jesus himself never paid tithe at once. Never, not even once. No record. In fact, in Matthew chapter 12, verse 1 to 6, please put it up. Matthew 12, verse 1 to 6. Please pay attention. At that time, Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn. And his disciples were unhungered and began to pluck the ears of corn and to eat. Next verse. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. But he said unto them, Have you not read what David did when he was unhungered and they that were with him? How he entered into the house of God and did eat the shoe bread, which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them which were with him, but only for the priests. Next verse. Or have you not read in the law how that on the Sabbath day the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? But I say unto you, that in this place is one greater than the temple. Look at Deuteronomy 23 verse 24. Pay attention. Where Jesus quoted from. When thou comest into thy neighbor's vineyard, then thou mayest eat grapes, thy fill, at thy own pleasure. But thou shalt not put any in your vessel. Go into his farm and eat. But don't take anything. Next verse. When thou comest into the standing corn of thy neighbor, then thou mayest pluck the ears with thine hand. But thou shalt not move a sickle unto thy neighbor's standing corn. And that is the same thing that David did with his boys. They entered the temple and ate and left. They didn't carry handbag to put extra. 
They just ate and left. And under the law, they are all right. It is not called stealing. But it has to be when you are hungry. Obviously, from the pictures painted of Jesus, he was not a wealthy person. Jesus never had a house. house. He didn't even have his own car. He didn't have a car. He didn't have a motorcycle. He wasn't wealthy, nor his parents. Because it was very clear, when he died, they wanted to bury him somewhere. Then Joseph of Arimathea had to come and, you know, struggle and beg for the body so they can bury him in his tomb. He is, his ministry was supported by others. Others had to give to Jesus to do ministry. And when he was hungry, they gave him food. Basically, the poor were to be taken care of. They were not to pay tithe. The strangers, fatherless, and widows were to be supported. So the tithe was to support those who had no other means of support. And also to just celebrate and rejoice. When you are doing that, you remember the Levites. Now go to Malachi in chapter 3. Again, let me ask you before we read. How many kinds of tithes do we have? Three. Alright? So anybody asking you to pay your tithe, asking which of them? Because we have the tithe of the Lord, we have the festival tithe, which you are the one to eat it, and then we have the tithe for the poor. Now, in Malachi chapter 3, which one was Malachi talking about? Read Malachi 3.10 with me. Malachi chapter 3 verse number 10. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse. I knew this scripture before I knew John 3.16. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse. That there may be meat in my house. And prove me now here with. So you the Lord of hosts. If I will not open you the windows of heaven. And pour you out a blessing. That there shall not be room enough to receive it. Question. Which one goes into the storehouse? Huh? The Lord's tithe. Which the Levites will take 10% of 10%. The land will give to the Levites 10%. Then the Levites will take 10% and give to the priest. The 10% given to the priest is the one that goes to the storehouse. It's not the tithe of the land that goes to the storehouse. The land will pay tithe to the Levites. The Levites will take 10% from the 10% and give it to the priests that were attending to the temple. Is it clear? That's fundamental. Now, so only one was to be taken into the storehouse. The Levites in the city will give to the priest. So people didn't take, take tithes directly to the priest. They took it to the Levites. And the Levites took 10% and gave to the priest. That's the one for the storehouse. When he says meat, he's talking of food. Let there be food at the altar. Those who minister at the altar will live by the altar. They will eat the food that the Levites brought to the storehouse. For the priests who are also Levites. But are living permanently in the storehouse. To serve the storehouse on behalf of Israel. So after giving the Levites 10%. They will now take 10% and take it to the priesthood. Do you understand? Is it clear? So everything is for Levi. Levi will now take out of Diaz. And give it to the minority who serve in the house. So it is 10% of 10%. Now, go back to Numbers 18, verse 9 to 32. You read that at home. Numbers 18, 9 to 32. But I want to read Numbers 18, verse 9. Numbers 18, 9. This shall be thine of the most holy things, reserved for the fire. Every oblation of theirs, every meat offering of theirs, every sin offering of theirs, Every trespass offering of theirs, which they shall render unto me, shall be most holy for thee and for thy sons. Give me verse 28 to 32 of Numbers 18. 
Thus you shall, thus you also shall offer and heave offering unto the Lord of all your tithes, which you receive of the children of Israel. And you shall give thereof the Lord's heave offering to Aaron the priest. Out of all your gifts, you shall offer every heave offering of the Lord, of all the best thereof, even the hallowed part thereof out of it. Therefore thou shalt say unto them, when you have heaved the best thereof from it, then it shall be counted unto the Levites as the increase of the threshing floor and as the increase of the wine press. Next verse. And you shall eat it in every place, ye and your households, for it is your reward for your service in the tabernacle of the congregation. Next verse. And you shall bear no sin by reason of it. When you have heaved from it the best of it, neither shall you pollute the holy things of the children of Israel, lest you die. Out of what you are giving, you take and give to your brethren, serving in the tabernacle. You can read these scriptures at home. Nehemiah 12, 44 to 47. Nehemiah 12, 44 to 47. Nehemiah 13, verse 4 to 13. Nehemiah 13, verse 4 to 13. Second Chronicles 31, 11. Second Chronicles 31, 11. Now, put up on the screen for me, Nehemiah 10, 35. Nehemiah chapter 10, verse 35. And to bring the first fruits of our ground, and the first fruit of all fruit of all trees, year by year, unto the house of the Lord. Why did Nehemiah talk about tithe? Because they had just come back from captivity and it is for the land. Secondly, they were building. They had just come back and they were building. Nehemiah 10, 36 to 37. Pay attention. Also the firstborn of our sons and of our cattle, as it is written in the law, and the firstlings of our herds and of our flocks, to bring to the house of our God unto the priest that minister in the house of our God. Look at 37a. And that we should bring the first fruits of our dough and our offerings and the fruit of all manner of trees, of wine and of oil unto the priest to the chambers of the house of our God and the tithes of our ground unto the Levites that the same Levites might have the tithes in all the cities of our tillage. Oil to the house of our God. To the Levites, that the Levites will have the tithes to give to those in the tabernacle. Now look at verse 38 of that same Nehemiah 10. And the priest, the sons of Aaron, shall be with the Levites. When the Levites take tithes, when the Levites take tithes, and the Levites shall bring up the tithe of the tithes, Unto the house of our God. To the chambers. Into the treasure house. So it was the Levites. That were to pay tithe of tithe to the priest. Who will now put it in the storehouse. Is it getting clear? Alright. Tithe of tithe. So who was Malachi 3 talking to? He was talking to the Levites. He was talking to the Levites. Who were to bring from 10%. 10% to the storehouse. So it's the Levites that they were telling that we are caused with the cause. Not the children of Israel. Not the children of Israel. But the Levites. Because Malachi 3.9 talks to the whole nation. Because the instruction was for the priests. But the Levites specifically. The instruction was given to the Levites and priests. But it involved the whole nation about not taking care of the oppressed, strangers, and the poor. So the key issue in Malachi was he was dealing with selfishness among the Levites. Selfishness. Which now affected what they were giving to the Levites and to the priest. The whole nation delivers all selfishness. And that was the essence of Malachi's prophecy. We will look at it. Why was Malachi a major voice? Malachi, 
Zechariah and Haggai were the three that talked about the house and the temple. Because they were after Nehemiah. So everything was the same dispensation, which is when they came back from exile. Look at Nehemiah 13, verse 4 to 13. But I will read verse 7 to 13. Nehemiah 13, 4 to 13. I will read 7 to 13. And I came to Jerusalem and understood of the evil that Elishib did for Tobiah in preparing him a chamber in the courts of the house of God. And it grieved me so. Therefore, I cast forth all the household stuff of Tobiah out of the chamber. Then I commanded and they cleansed the chambers. And Thida brought her again the vessels of the house of God with the meat offering and the frankincense. And I perceived that the portions of the Levites had not been given them. For the Levites and the singers that did the work were fled everyone to his field. Then contended I with the rulers and said, Why is the house of God forsaken? And I gathered them together and set them in their place. Twelve. Then brought all Judah the tithe of the corn, and the new wine and the oil, unto the treasuries. Thirteen. And I made treasurers over the treasuries. Shelembiah the priest, and Zadok the scribe, and the Levites, Pedia, and next to them was Hanan, the son of Zakor, the son of Mataniah. For they were content, counted faithful, and their office was to distribute unto their brethren. So they were restoring the practice after exile of the Levites and the priesthood. So that's the same dispensation where you find Malachi and Haggai and Zechariah. Look at Malachi chapter 1 verse 6. Malachi chapter 1 verse 6. <clears throat> a son honoreth his father and a father his master. If then I be a father, where is mine honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear? Say the Lord of hosts unto you, O priests, that despise my name, and you say, wherein have we despised your name? So the tithe was restricted to the promised land. The first audience of the book of Malachi we are the priests. Malachi was writing to the priests. Look at verse 9. Malachi 1 9. Hallelujah. And now I pray you beseech God that you will be gracious unto us. This had been by your means, which he regard your presence, saith the Lord of hosts. Malachi chapter 2, verse 1. Pay attention. And now, O ye priests. This commandment is for you. This is not for Israel. It's for the priest. Malachi 3.3. 3. Malachi chapter 3 verse 3. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi. And purge them as gold and silver. That they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. So the instructions were to the Levites. The Levites were the ones dealt with because they were the ones that brings the tithe into the storehouse. So if anybody want to practice tithe in column 2 and 3, Exodus to Malachi and the four Gospels, he has to practice all these things step by step. So who will be the Levites? And who will be the priests? And then somebody said, well, the Levites will be those who serve and the priests will be the pastors. So church workers, Levites, pastors, priests. So that means tithe should be paid to church workers. Then the church workers will take 10% and give to the pastors. Are you following? <laughs> it is not practicable. It is not practicable. That's an assumption I just made. It means that the church workers will be the ones really keeping the money. But if you follow strict interpretation, that's how it ought to be. If you want to really do tight. And there will be one that eats the festival one. 
You know, our, is it Dr. Gabriel? I was telling that a church member would just come to his pastor and say, Hey, pastor, this is my tithe. Excuse me, let me buy a bottle of alcohol with it. The pastor will say, God punish you. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> say, Pastor, this is my tithe. Let me buy alcohol. I'll give you a glass of it. I'll drink the rest. <laughs> you know? Now, so it is for the poor, the strangers, the widows, the fatherless. It is becoming funny because it was not written to you. The people it was written to had the circumstances to apply those instructions to. Did you observe that the priests don't tithe? So, pastors should not tithe to a bigger man of God. Because the priests don't tithe. Then notice that the priests don't own property. So if you want to do titan, you man of God that want to do titan, you must never own a property. Even the Levites, it is just given to them to dwell in. You can't own property and be saying they should pay tithe to you. Because once they start paying tithe to you, you don't have any property or business or entitlement. You're supposed to take your property and live in the church. Then they'll be bringing for you anise, curry, <laughs> pepper, maggi, crayfish. <laughs> Are we still in the <laughs> You can't own anything. You can't own cars. You can't buy jets. Just stay in the church and be eating spices with the things they bring. Also, the tithe is all crops and animals. So they will bring goat, chicken, you just be there eating. That's all you have to do. Eat and attend to the tabernacle. It becomes impracticable and it is impossible for you to tithe. It's called the law. The law is not good news. The law is for the unrighteous. The law is for the sinner. The law is not for the righteous. So anybody demanding tithe, ask him which one? The Lord's tithe, festival tithe, or the poor? And then ask him, are you a Levite? Because I'm supposed to give my tithe to the Levite, then the Levite will give tithe of tithe to you, the priest. So please, sir, if you want tithe, where are the Levites? And they must be in the record in the genealogy of Levites in Israel. Today we have a new and living way. We have a new and living way. We don't function like this. Our hearts are not this hard. The titan was given to the people because of the hardness of their heart. We have, we have a heart of flesh. We are the circumcision that worship God in the spirit. Giving is our nature. We don't need a schoolmaster to beat us around, to bring curry, cumin, eh, anise. We don't need a schoolmaster. We are people that are born of God from the heart. Therefore, we give generously for the work of God. To give a lot to people means their heart is hardened. God has purged our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. That's where we are today. The interesting fact of these issues is, in the book of Acts, when Jesus was going to instruct the non-Jews, I mean James, when James, in the book of Acts, was going to instruct the non-Jews, he just said, abstain from pollution. Abstain from things offered to idols. Abstain from fornication. He didn't even add tight. Even when James was giving them a little part of the law, he didn't add tight because tight is small, 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 small. It is not significant in the law. That's why Jesus said, you have left the weightier matters. So even under the law, tight is such a minor issue. Minor issue. And where I just read is in Acts 15, 19 to 21. And you know, brother, brother Peter called it why put on them heavy body, which neither we, so tightening is a heavy yoke, which neither we nor our fathers 
could keep. That's why churches that emphasize tithing, the greater percentage of the members don't pay the tithe. And some of them don't pay it truly. They just give so that they won't say they didn't pay. Most of them. A pastor said to me, with all the tithing I'm teaching, the people are not giving. I said, because you're not showing them who they are. You are trying to do schoolmaster over them. Meanwhile, these people, you know, are born again. So why don't you let them alone? Teach them generosity and see them give radically. Because generosity is the nature of the born again man. Are we here? So James didn't even add tight. How come they didn't add tight? Was it not a matter of the law? It's not difficult to see that the tight was for the land. As long as you're not in Canaan, Tithe does not affect you. The tithe was for people going to Canaan while they're in Canaan. And even in Canaan, if they take them to exile, they stop tithing. Till the day they come back. Are you in Canaan? You are in New York? Someone says, well, but Dr. Damina, you don't have revelation, revelation, revelation. The land is where, where we are in Christ today. So in Christ, we are in Canaan. Then if that land was symbolic of where we are today, that means Melchizedek is symbolic. That means the temple is symbolic. Then it also means that the tithe is symbolic. You know, the tithe is the offering of the body of Jesus. That's actually what the tithe is. It's the offering of the body of Jesus. What he gave to Melchizedek. Today, Jesus is the high priest offering himself as our mediation. He's the high priest offering himself as the mediation. So they couldn't even add tithe. And if you want to tithe like Abraham, go and fight war. Win the war and come back with the spoils of war. Second Corinthians chapter 8. We have a new and living way. So how do we give? We give by grace like our father. Look at 2 Corinthians 8, 1 to 5. <clears throat> Getting blessed? Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. How that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we will receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministry to the saints. Verse 5. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord. And unto us by the will of God. Then he now tells you, that was grace giving. Then he tells you in verse 9, look at verse 9. Second Corinthians 8, 9. Glory to God. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. That though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. That you through his poverty may be rich. He's not talking about money. He is saying Jesus emptied himself on the cross so that we can be made the righteousness of God in him. He said, it's the same way we give. We give of ourselves to meet the need of others. Just like Jesus gave of himself to meet our need. That is grace giving. We give by grace. We give out of a motivation to love. We are not giving to receive. We are not constrained by any legality. Look at 2 Corinthians 9 verse 7. Getting blessed? 2 Corinthians 9 7. Every man according as he proposed in his heart. So let him give. Not grudgingly or of necessity. For God Love it, a cheerful giver. If you look at Acts chapter 4 and chapter 2, people gave as much as people needed. Nobody gave in percentages. All these were Jewish people. Acts 2, 45, 46. Acts 2, 45, 46. Acts 4, 35, 36. They gave as men had need. 
When there was famine, what did the church do? You know, Dr. Gabriel, if he's in our, our church today and people are going through recession, pastors will come and teach on five keys to breakthrough. And one of it is give your last. Give your Isaac. Sow your last offering. But what did the church do in the book of Acts? When there was famine in Jerusalem. Acts 11.29. Acts 11.29. Then the disciples, every man, according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea. They didn't go to teach them principles of prosperity. They took of what they had and sent it to support them. That is how to help people that are in need. It's not principles. You support them while they are going through their need and looking for how to get another job. You support them. You give to them. You identify with their needs. That's the way it functions in the kingdom. Not some uncooked principles of prosperity. If it is tight, give your last so it can be soft. And I say, but pastor, I've been giving and it has not yet come back. When the clouds are full, then the rain will fall. So keep giving to fill up the cloud. Fraud. Keep giving till Jesus comes. Be filling up which cloud? Which cloud? Which cloud? Which cloud? Even in the law, the poor was, were not told to give. Even under the law, they were to be supported. Anybody attributing lack to not giving is deceiving you. Anybody who tells you that the reason why you don't have is because you're not a giver is deceiving you. Uh, have you ever heard people say, Give us never lack. It's not true. Give us lack. Give us never lack. It's not true. I used to say it some years ago because I had people saying and it sounded nice. But when you look at it very well, give us lack. The reason why you lack is because you gave. Because when you gave, what remains? Nothing. So what are you in? Lack. What are you talking about? Some say, no, what they mean is that when you give, it will come back. No, in God's, in God's economy, give expecting nothing in return. Because nothing will come. So in giving, you are giving out of grace. That is, you are depriving yourself, inconveniencing yourself because you love. The way God inconveniences himself because he loves. So that others can benefit. Expecting nothing. It's not a transaction. We are not in a business. We are in a relationship. We are in a relationship with our father. So we don't give to get. We just give. Because we are acting like our father. He gave. And he gave his best. If I'm teaching good shout I hear you. Yeah. So anybody attributing lack to not giving. Is deceiving you. And what I see from the tithe. Are lessons for generosity. How to take care of others. How to support those that don't have support. In honor of God. We are born of God. To walk in love. We are giving. We are not looking at our own needs. When we give. We are looking at the need of others. I mean look at the John chapter 6 account. The little boy had his lunch box. He was not the only one with lunch box. Others were with lunch box. But it's the little boy that gave Jesus. But the boy didn't know that Jesus was going to perform a miracle and use his food and feed everybody. He didn't know that. But the intent was not for Jesus to multiply. When he gave his lunch box, he gave it. And Jesus used it for a miracle to meet the needs of others. Are we teaching here? Yeah, that's kingdom giving. We give for people's needs to be met. What is our reward when their need is met? If I supported you to pay your school fees and you paid your school fees and graduated, my joy is you're a graduate. My reward is that you're a graduate. That's my joy. That's my reward. It's not some income coming back. For money to come, how I did it before, I would still do it. If I was working, I would still work so that I would get more money to support more people. That's how to live. Let him that stole steal no more, but let him walk with his hand, that which is good, that he may have to give to those who are in need. Am I teaching good here? Yeah? yeah. 
That's kingdom giving. That's how we give in the kingdom. We are not selfish people. We are selfless people. We henceforth live not for ourselves, but we live for him who died for us. And how do we love God? By loving God's people. We love God by loving God's people. Are we still in the building? I believe, you know, that, that boy just gave. Just gave. He was expecting nothing. When we give, we consider the need. We meet the need. We are not tight as. We don't tight. There is no reason to tight. You are not a Jew. And you are not in Canaan. You are in Christ. We don't tight. We don't give tight. We don't pay tight. We don't tight. We give. Tighting is not giving. Giving is not tithing. We don't tight. Believers don't tight. Why? We are not Jews. Two, we are not in Canaan. We give to meet the needs of the brethren. We give to support the weak. We give to be a blessing to others. We give expecting nothing. We give because that's our nature. And we give radically. Jakalabada. Yeah. We give to be a blessing. Blessed to be a blessing. We are not giving for it to come back. Give and it shall come back to you. Good measure. Uh -uh, uh -uh, uh -uh, uh -uh. We just give until the need is met. I didn't hear a powerful amen. Are you blessed tonight? Get on your feet. That's all I got for you. Praise God. Oh, Jagabada. I still have a lot more to cover tomorrow. And I have a lot more to cover. We still have some more to cover on Titan. Then we will move into first fruits. And we will move into firstborn. All those offerings. We will de demystify them. And put an end to all of that. So you can have liberty to serve God. And enjoy your relationship with God. I thought somebody would shout hallelujah. Father, we pray for everybody under the sound of my voice in this building, on television, on radio, on online, everybody that is connected to this service, our campuses. We pray that revelation knowledge keeps growing, that the word of God will liberate God's people, that the people of God will enjoy the liberty they have in Christ and use their liberty as an occasion to serve the kingdom of God. I decree that barriers are broken, mindsets are being corrected. I decree that guilt and condemnation is being flushed out. I decree that your people are rising up boldly in righteousness to enjoy their salvation. They are standing fast in the liberty where with Christ has set us free. And we rejoice tonight. Father, we thank you that we are generous. We are generosity is our nature. We give generously. We give of ourselves. We give of our resources. We and all that we are, we belong to you. Our resources are all for the service of the kingdom. Therefore, you are Lord over our heart, our soul, our body, and our resources. And we give until the need is met. Thank you, Father, because generous believers are rising all over the world. Generous believers, believers who love God so much that they are willing to give up themselves and give up their resources so that other believers can be enriched, so that the unbelievers can be touched by the gospel. And Father, we rejoice that the spirit of generosity, the spirit of liberality is activated and steered up on the inside of your people. We give and give until the need is met. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' precious name. And every believer says a powerful amen. Are you blessed tonight or what? Glory! Amen! Woo! I tell you I'm excited tonight. Hey guys, what a joy to serve you the grace of God. You, know, you don't want to go away. I'm joining Mr. Michael Bush in the next one or two minutes so we can answer questions and respond to your emails in Ask the Counselor. Ask the Counselor. But before I join Mr. Michael Bush, I want to ask you to give tonight, give in faith, give out of generosity and honor so that this assignment God has given us to reach the ends of the earth can be carried out. And when we give, we give responsibly. We give intentionally. We give deliberately. So if you're watching online on television, you're listening on radio, Mr. Michael Bush will read the banking details. But online, the banking details are scrolling. On television, the banking details are scrolling. You can just go ahead and do your transfers and, and give your offerings with joy tonight. But it's a joy and an honor to serve you. And I want you to know that as you make your monies available through your monies, people are reached 
Through your monies, saints are blessed. Through your monies, more people are coming to the liberty that only Christ provides. Praise God. What a blessing tonight. Lift up your offerings. Let's pray. Father, we rejoice for the privilege to give. And we give in faith. We give with joy. We give in honor of Christ. And we decree that our offerings are a sweet smell before you. Thank you, Lord, that everyone giving, your needs are met according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. You lack nothing. You are enriched in all things. Grace abound towards you. You always have sufficiency in all things. You abound unto every good work. Thank you, Father, for answered prayer. In Jesus' name, and every believer says a powerful amen. amen. Oh, glory to God. Are you blessed tonight? Can we give the Lord a little shout in this building? <laughs> glory! Amen. Hey guys, you know we love you. You don't want to miss tomorrow. Tell more people about this. Share the videos. Let's get the message to the ends of the earth so more people are liberated from this bondage, this yoke that both Peter and the rest could not bear. This yoke of the Lord, this tighty yoke, let it be broken so that people are released to generosity and live out their true identity in Christ Jesus. We love you guys. Tomorrow evening, 6 p.m., GMT plus one. And I'm joining Mr. Michael Bush right now. You don't want to go away. Be a part of Ask the Counselor. Until I see you in the other studio, enjoy the grace of Christ. Let's celebrate viewers around the world for being a part of this service tonight. Glory! Amen! We trust Woo! that you Amen. by this message. For these, all the messages and books by Dr. Abel Damino, please call plus 234-806-800- 9939 or email powercityoffice at gmail.com Thanks for staying tuned to this point of the program. It's Ask the Counselor now, and my name is Michael Bush. Okay, bank details, especially for our radio audience, you have free bank accounts. Power City is the name of all free. I start um, on this edition with FCMB 2982-68-2028, 2982-68-2028. That's FCMB, Power City International. Zenith is number 2, 10, 12, 36, 59, 12. 10, 12, 36, 59, 12. That's for Zenith. And Power City International remains the account name, just as it is for UBA, 139, 26, 465. 139, 26, 465. For sponsorship, you just need to quickly call us up on plus 234, 803, or you email Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com. Dr. There, of course, is DR. Okay. So in another 10 seconds, we should actually get the program underway, just as I announced, with pride and privilege and humility and honor, the arrival of Global Baba in this uh, part of the program. Global Baba is a prolific author. He's uh, written 32 books and counting. He's an uh, international televangelist. He's everywhere on radio, he's on TV, he's on the social media. And I'm so privileged and honored to have this teacher of the world, Dr. Abel Damina. The Intercontinental, Mr. Bush. So Global good to Baba. have you around today. Global Baba, so, so nice to have what you. What a day, man. Global Baba, you just would do our opening prayer so that we can get underwear. Straight ahead. Father, we rejoice that the gospel is thriving around the nations of the earth. Laborers have been raised all over the bloomable planet, men and women equipped with sound doctrine to make known the fragrance of Jesus' grace. We thank you that our societies are opening up to the truth of the gospel. Men and women, an army of people are moving into the light. We pray for our governor, we pray for our, our executive cabinet in the state here. Thank you that you are working through them to create an enablement, an environment of peace for the gospel to keep advancing. We pray for our world, that the name of Jesus is finding expression in every community, every nation, every state, and every continent. And we rejoice that the gospel shines and the darkness has nowhere to hide. So we give you praise for massive salvation of souls. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Kelvin, 
starts from there. Kelvin writing from Cameron says, thank you so much, Global Baba, for the wisdom in God's word unleashed to us every day. In 2 Peter 2.20, who was he referring to? If these were sinners, is it possible for a sinner to have a pyknosis? Considering that was the word he used there for knowledge. In 2 Thessalonians 2.3, is a falling away referred to here as apostasy? What are the consequences of apostasy? I remember having listened to a tutorial episode in which you mentioned one of the churches John talked about in the book of Revelation as those who had uh, resorted to apostasy. What becomes of them? Also in 1 Timothy 4.1, now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Is departing from the faith losing your salvation? And finally, Mark 13:13, 13, 13, and ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Please kindly throw more light on these verses. Thank you. Well, again, uh, the first scripture he didn't quote, I would like us to start from the, the Peter, so yes. they can put it on the screen. In Second Peter 2:20. 2 Second Peter 2:20. Dog going back to his vomit. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. Next verse. But it is happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the soul that was washed to her wallowing in the time, in so, the mire. So now it's easy because he, he tells you the dog has gone back to his vomit. So that means before the knowledge came, the person was a dog. After the knowledge came, the person was still a dog. And after the person has gotten knowledge as a dog, the person went back to his vomit. means the person was never born again. So that scripture is not for believers. That scripture is for people who come among us and act like us, but they are not born again. They are called false brethren or false converts. Now, the apostasy in the book of Revelation, if you observe, he was talking to individuals and he was talking to the churches. He wrote letters to the churches, to the church in this, to the church in that. Then for believers, he said, to him that overcome it. So he was talking to two classes of people. The apostasy was the churches. The, the churches and the leadership of those churches allow for wrong doctrine to be preached in those churches. And those wrong doctrines being preached in those churches, you know, uh, misled people from the truth of the gospel. And he said the judgment for them, he was going to take away the candle, their candlestick. That is, he was going to shut down. And most of those churches were extinguished. They never lasted. They never had a legacy. That's what happens to any ministry that compromises the preaching of the gospel. The only gospel that will stand the test of time is the gospel of Christ. So if a man of God is not preaching the right gospel, his ministry will not last. The legacy of his ministry will expire in a short while because such messages don't have longevity. They don't last. The only gospel that lasts is the gospel of Christ. It is settled forever. So such ministries don't last. Now, when the Bible talks about falling away, it was actually talking about people who have had the gospel, believed the gospel, and then got into mixture. The kind of people that Brother Paul will speak to in Galatia and call them foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you. Having received the gospel by faith, why are you now gone back to be perfected in the flesh? That's what he's talking about. Such people don't lose their salvation, but such people also don't walk in the reality of what they have in Christ for the rest of their lives. And of course, they never get the reward for their ministry, they never get reward for service, they never get reward for preaching those useless gospel that they preach that is not centered on the person of Christ. Okay, Lubaba, how are you able to pick and align these questions that I ask you? For instance, it's just a battle of questions, about four questions in one, and without writing anything, without taking any notes, how are you able to answer them one by one? Because when I was listening to them, I knew that they were all doing with falling away apostasy and all of that. So it's easy for me, having interpreted the first one, which was a bit different. The rest were lumped together as one question. Okay, so Global Power is not as if... I've asked this question before, but I still need to ask because I don't know why things have changed. Yes. It's not as if you are asking, you, you're being asked a question and you're answering. And you have, um, because some prophets used to tell us that there will be a screen 
Or something would appear and you are seeing it written for you there. Now those prophets are... And, uh, so you don't see a screen? Those prophets are wonderful. Okay. I don't see screen. Okay, you don't see screen. <laughs> what do you my see? My screen is in my mind. Oh, right. Okay. Okay, so still from Cameroon. Oh, oh, oh. That's a caller. For okay. Uh, <laughs> a caller, uh, producer would like us to take a first call at this point of the program. Hello. 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 Yes, many thanks for joining us. Yes, go ahead. Good evening. Yes. Yeah. And it's me, Daniel, from you. Go ahead, Daniel. Uh, I want to ask a question. Of course. Go ahead. Uh, please, I want him to explain Hebrews chapter 9, verse 10 for me. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 10. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15. Verse 10. 10. 10. Or Hebrews 9, 10. Put it up for us. What's, yes. the, what's the question? What, what's what the do question? you want him to explain? <laughs> okay, sure. So we can see good there, Hebrews, Hebrews 9, 10. Which stood only in myths and drinks and diverse uh, washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. It's talking about practices in the Old Testament that foreshadowed Christ. It was put on them until. So it was for a period of time. The reformation was actually the coming of Christ. So those practices of washing of feet, water baptism, eating bread and ribena, all of them were until the coming of Christ, who is the substance that those things foreshadowed. That's just what the writer of Hebrews was explaining to the believing Jews, non-believing Jews, and will be believing Jews to abandon those things so they can embrace the reality that is in Christ. Okay, so Global Baba, um, you woke up um, during or about the time of Sutera 7 yes. to have um, asked the counselor to have, what was it before? It was a question and answer segment. Yes. You know, so do you think you missed something? Would you have rather you started right from Sutera 1? Or you were not ready then for this? Well, I wasn't ready and I, I didn't receive instructions for it as a then. Uh -huh. So... Timing is everything, everything. also. So you received so instruction. The timing was right. You received we, instruction yes, from? From the Lord. Oh, okay. The Lord spoke to me. Global Baba. Bam. And we and, got into it. Another question. Another and then caller. he prepared you too. Absolutely. And brought us and it's happening. And uh, the unreturnable call. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, Global Baba. There's another caller. Hello. Hello. Good evening. Many thanks for joining us. Where are you calling from? My name is Brown. Call it from Uyo. Brown, take it up. Please, I, before I ask my question, I want to take this time to appreciate you, Papa. Thank you. You have been an amazing teacher. And ever since I've been listening to you, my Christian life has been catapulted to the next level. Praise God. I want to say thank you. Thank you. All right, sir, please. I want you to throw more light on God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Because the reason why I ask so, sometimes our preachers preach in a, in a sense that the Old Testament was the regime of God the Father. Then the fourth gospel is a, it was the regime of God the Son. And now is the regime of God, the Holy Spirit. And they quoted all manners of things that in the regime of God, the Holy Spirit, that is also a time of vain dances. And that's so please, I just want to know, if, are these three personalities, or they are one? Please, thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Brown. I and my father are one, John 10.30. There are not three personalities. You know, it's one God. Now, the concept of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost is a concept of redemption. Redemption. God himself cannot be killed, cannot die. Man has sinned, man must die. So, in order for man to be free, the sinless must help the sinner. Man is not sinless. Man must die. The only sinless person is God. It is appointed unto men once to die. So, man has an appointment to die eternally. So what happens? God loves man. So God became a man in the person of Jesus to die so that he can pay for man and free man. And then when he rose from the dead, a man cannot live in a man. So he became the Holy Ghost to live in you and make the reality of what he has obtained in his resurrection take effect on your inside. That's what the concept is. 
Okay, so Global Baba. Yes. As we sit here now listening to you, we can also become like you in future? Already you are becoming. How? <laughs> By learning. Go, but when you give some of these uh, explanations, I even get lost more. <laughs> It's just a period. After a while. Okay. After a while. And do I have to fast and pray for that one? You are a prophet already. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's make progress even as we still stay on in Cameroon. Greetings, Dr. Ebel Damina, my global Baba. It is with great pleasure that I write to you. Having come to know you and your Christocentric teaching has been a blessing to me. I write from the Republic of Cameroon to appeal to come to Power City International Headquarters in Nigeria to be fathered and mentored by you, just like Paul, fathered and mentored Timothy in the doctrine of Christ. Upon salvation, I've had a compelling desire to preach the gospel worldwide. I've come to know the responsibility I have in preaching the gospel as far as the earth is concerned. Our vision, mission, and mandate statements. My vision statement, Global Baba, is to spread the everlasting gospel. Re Revelation 14, 6-7, my mission statement is to reveal Christ. That is in Colossians 1, 27, and my mandate statement is to raise disciples, Matthew 28, 18 to 20. I need a sound mentor like you, Global Baba, so I'm writing to ask if I should come over to Nigeria from Cameroon, and if you would take me as your Timothy to raise me for the work of the ministry. I'm hoping to hear from you, thanks. Global Baba, the only minus to this piece, to this entry, is the fact that how do you write such a, such a profound entry without your name? Yeah. He left out his name. Yeah, what we'll do is our office will email him mm. and get all his details and work out details. We would love to, we would love to t teach you, train you, equip you. That's part of what we're here for, you know. But our office will reach out to you and see if they're able to work out something with you, you know. And then you can come stay here for one year, two years. There was a woman that came from Cameroon and stayed here for three years. Wow. Three full years on her own and was mm. just coming to church to learn. Another woman came from, uh, from I think, France. Wow. She even came with her white friend who came and stayed there for one month. And then she stayed there for like three, four years. And she's in Nigeria now. She has relocated because of this gospel. And there are people like that. So you can come. Come learn. Our last caller for now. Hello. Hello. Good evening. Good evening. Bless you. Hi, my name is Abdul. I'm coming from Nigeria. Abdul. Okay, Abdul. Yes. Uh, Papa, I wanted to, I wanted to ask some questions concerning the details that are, uh, COVID-19 vaccination, which is, it's actually safe for the new vaccine to go ahead and take the vaccine. Uh, it's, 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 it's a government, uh, political, uh, it's only thing, uh, it's the same aspect of it that is not going to be for the new vaccine, as you know. Okay. Some people are saying that for the new that is, it's okay. a randomized, uh, Okay, okay, Abdul, thank you. COVID-19. Yeah, I've this before. The vaccine, take it if you find it. And if you find, bring for me, I will take two. Global Baba. There's nothing wrong with it. Especially don't, don't the be, ministry. Don't, the, yeah. the health ministry says so. Yes, once the health ministry mm -hmm. says so, go, go for it. I mean, if your federal ministry of health says it's okay, go for it. So all this talk of it being antichrist, satanic. No, 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 no. All that is just, is just, it's not Bible. Those are conspiracy theories. They have mm. no place in the Bible. Okay. No, Baba, from Cameroon, let's get to Malawi. My name is Blessings Gwedesa from Malawi. My question is, is it possible to always do the right thing? How possible is this? I need your prayers. Always possible to do the right thing if you stay in the word of God. The word of God will build you up and bring you to that place. You grow into it. But you need teaching. You need sound teaching. You need to, to be equipped. You need to be taught the word. So as you keep following, you will keep growing and growing and growing where you will now walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, where you're fruitful unto every good work. It's a prayer for the believer in the epistles. From Malawi now to Lesotho. Hello, Global Baba and Mr. Intercontinental Michael Bush. I'm Ledoko Motebe in Lesotho. I recently asked Global Baba for clarity on two phrases, uh, kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God. You answered me very well that they are the same, only that they can be used interchangeably. Thank you, Global Baba, sir. Today, I want to know what exactly is the kingdom, of, uh, the kingdom that Jesus used to speak about in the Bible. I read about him likening to various things in his parables. The Bible also in Matthew 4.33 tells us that Jesus was preaching the gospel of the kingdom. I also read that John the Baptist was the greatest of all born of a woman, but the least in the kingdom is greater than John. 
This emphasizes that John wasn't in the kingdom because at least in the kingdom is greater than him. Therefore, Global Baba, I want to know what exactly is the kingdom of God and who are in it or who and who qualify to be in it. May you please also explain this verse to me, Matthew 16, 28. As shortly I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Let it go from Leseto. Wow, that's some intelligent Bible Absolutely. study you did there. Mm. I'm really excited and I'm glad to answer your questions. All right, so the kingdom of God that Jesus referred to was himself. He was the reality of the kingdom. So when he says the kingdom of God is likened unto, it was his way of telling them that the kingdom of God you're looking for is already here among you. All that he kept saying was referring to him. Jesus is the reality of God's kingdom. And when he says some will not taste death until they see the kingdom, he was saying some of you here will not die until you. It dawns on you that the kingdom is already among you. Remember, Jesus said, if I, by the finger of God, cast out demons, then the kingdom is among you. Then Jesus said, the kingdom does not come by observation, but the kingdom is within you. Now, after Jesus died and rose, the book of Romans says, the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Ghost. And Jesus is made unto us righteousness, sanctification. So Jesus is the reality of that kingdom. Why wasn't John the Baptist? A part of it. Why is the least greater than John? The Old Testament prophet said, Thus saith the Lord. John the Baptist became the greatest among them because John said, Behold the Lamb of God. But the least in the kingdom, Christ lives in you. So because he lives in you, that's why you're greater than the prophets of the Old Testament. So today, Christ in the heart of a man is the reality of God's kingdom in that man. Okay, Global Baba. Global Bar is not, um, I, I think, uh, months after we started what we're doing now. Yes. It's the first time I've heard you commend someone openly for asking questions. So perhaps that commendation has forced the guy in Lesotho to ask more questions. You know, the, the reason is because we are reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John within two weeks. Mm. And all those questions are from Matthew, Mark. So you. the person must have been reading. Really? That's why I'm putting the comment. Absolutely. Yes. Okay, so he continues. It's still another entry from him. That's um, Leloko Motebe in uh, Leseto. Hello, Global Baba. May I ask for explanation of these scriptures and parables? Matthew 24, 13. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. Many are called, and if few are chosen. The parable of the wise and foolish virgins in Matthew 25. And lastly, the parable of the faithful servant and the evil servant, especially the part where he speaks about the evil servant from verses 48 to 51. Who does an evil servant represent, Global Baba? Matthew 24, 48 to 51. But if that evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying, is coming and begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he's not looking for him and at an hour that he's not aware of and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Thank you, Global Baba. All right, so all of these are parables. We'll go over them one by one. one. Uh, they, oh, they do we have the time? Sharp, sharp, sharp. Okay. Now, so remember, a parable is, is, is a, a, a mode of communication. It, it, it has a fact. It has a fiction in it. The only thing you're looking for is the lesson in every parable. Parables are not literal, so don't take them literal. After reading through, you look for the lesson in them. So the first one. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. Endure to the end, there are talks of persecution. He that endures persecution, okay? Because you shall be hated, you shall be, you know, persecuted for my name's sake. He that endures persecution in the work of ministry. That's what he's talking about. Many are called, but a few are chosen. All right, so what Jesus was saying is, I have come, I'm available to many, but only a few of you have understood that I have come and have responded to my coming. The parable. So, Global Baba, we leave uh, Europe now and we head to the Americas. Canada, here we come. Global Baba, my name is Ivode. I write from Montreal, Canada. I'd like to thank you. Your teachings have changed my life completely. I love you so much. And I bought your book, Life Before the Cross and Life After the Cross. I've read where you said that before the cross, people went to the temple to pray, but now after the cross, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. But even now, we still go to church, Global Baba. My question, therefore, do we have two churches or just one church, our body? Another question. I can't find the preaching of Soteria Season 6, Part 9 on YouTube. Can you please help me find it? All right. Well, remember, we have the universal church and we have the local church. The universal church, um, I have a full teaching on ecclesiology, the local church. You can order for it. But the universal church is the body of all those who believe in Christ worldwide together. While the local church is the assemblage of believers within a locality for the purpose of teaching, training, 
discipleship and the advancement of the gospel of Christ through evangelism. Okay, Global Papa still staying on in Canada. I have another interesting entry. Says hello, Dr. Damina and Mr. Michael Bush. I live in Canada. I've been listening to you every Sunday for about three to four months now. I really enjoy the teachings. I have a question for my mother about marriage. My father, Global Baba, died 19 years ago, and my mother got married again 12 years after in 2014 to a pastor. But since then, her life has been hell. Our lives have also been worse. The only good thing, Global Baba, is that we came to Canada. Even so, it has been a fight every single day. Um, for my sister and me and my stepfather and his children, life has just been complicated. They are always uh, disputing about everything. They insult themselves. It has become a real emotional abuse, Global Baba, every day. I decided to leave the house with my sister in 2018. In 2019, my mom decided to move in with us. My stepfather called me and asked me to talk to her because a Christian cannot get divorced. I talked with her, and after that, she changed her mind. They decided to talk, and I thought it would get better, but no, my mom is getting sick because of that. She can't sleep anymore. He will call her all sorts of names. He would disgrace her in front of his children. He would say to people that she's into adultery. He would um, even disgrace her everywhere, saying she's not a Christian. She's, she's prayed, or she prayed that God would change him, but it's not working. She started praying that God gives her the strength to live on with him. But I'm afraid for her and her baby because they have a child together. I told her that I think they can split for a while and see how it goes. She says that Jesus doesn't accept divorce and that marriage is for life. That she doesn't want to miss heaven because of divorce. Then I told her, after listening to you, that she cannot miss heaven. She said she would pray and ask God if she can divorce. Because uh, before getting married, she asked God and he answered that the man was the one. After a prayer, she called me a few days ago and said that she got these scriptures, 1 Corinthians 7, 10 to 11, Hebrews 10, 35, 38. She concluded that Jesus wants us to stay in marriage. But me, Global Baba, I am not convinced and I fear for her. What does the scripture say, please? You better get your mother out of that place before you get ready for burial. You better go get your mother out. Tell her to leave that place first. When Jesus finished working on the man, you should go back. If you want her alive, especially since she's not able to sleep anymore, she can't sleep, she's not happy, that's already, you know, dangerous for her health and well-being. So that's my advice. Get out of that place. Jesus is not the one that gave her a husband. She's the one that married the man. So if she had a revelation where Jesus gave her a husband, it was a, it was a dream. It wasn't from Jesus. It's very important. You better rescue your mother quickly so that she doesn't die before the time where she's supposed to die. Okay, Global Baba, we must leave it here. So we're spending the night in Canada, out there in the Americas. We're back tomorrow in style. Many thanks for staying tuned and enjoying our program. We continue on Radio Inuyo tonight. Yes, tonight we're live on uh, Inspiration, 9 to 10, Heritage, 10 to 12. Tomorrow morning, 545 XLFM. Tomorrow morning, 11 to 1 p.m., Radio Acquire Bomb, 1 to 3 XLFM. 3 to 5, you know your FM, and we're back here tomorrow evening on Comfort FM, 6 to 8 p.m., GMT plus one, and on all platforms. Okay, so Global Baba, we must say bye-bye. This is Michael Bush, your anchor, inviting Global Baba to take us home. The Intercontinental, Mr. Bush. Glory to God. I tell you, man, it's been wonderful today. Thank you again. Everybody, thank you for giving us the opportunity to serve you the grace of God. Don't forget to invite more people to be part of us tomorrow. It's going to be explosive tomorrow as we continue to explore the riches of God's grace in Christ Jesus. It's, it's been a wonderful time. We love you guys. Enjoy the rest of your day until we see you tomorrow. Be blessed. Goodbye, Goodbye. from Uyo, Nigeria. Amen. Amen.